do have a uh, heavy to extreme cell at your 1 to 2 o'clock. The reports the pilot of the plane may have been doing aerial acrobatics just before... By no stretch of the imagination are we healed, and we may never be healed. It's 6.45 p.m. on January 13th, 2013, a gloomy, overcast evening on the mid-Atlantic coast. Three miles from the end of runway 14 at Dover Air Force Base, a Piper Arrow glides silently through the clouds, propeller windmilling in the slipstream, its pilot searching desperately for the glow of runway lights through the gloom. Just a few hours earlier, such a dire situation is almost unthinkable. In Sandersville, Georgia, the Arrow's pilot, an orthopedic trauma surgeon, is preparing for a routine aerial commute to Delaware's Summit Airport. He's scheduled to perform surgery in nearby Dover the following morning. It's 10 a.m. when he requests a DUOTS briefing for an afternoon flight. The verdict is mixed. IFR conditions prevail over a large swath of the Mid-Atlantic, and terminal forecasts call for ceilings of three and 400 feet, with visibilities of two miles in mist and light rain. Starting around 4 p.m., however, conditions are expected to improve significantly with visibility increasing to six miles and ceilings rising above 1,000 feet. It's not an ideal forecast, but given the pilot's qualifications, it's hardly a showstopper. The 600-hour private pilot is instrument rated and current with nearly 80 hours of actual IMC log. He's flown 30 hours in the previous 90 days, and his airplane has a WAS-enabled Garmin 430 and an STEC 30 autopilot. Timing his arrival in Delaware to coincide with the expected break in the weather, the pilot files for a 1.30 p.m. departure and chooses Baltimore, where the weather is forecast to improve more dramatically as his alternate. At liftoff, Aero 49er 75 Sierra is carrying in excess of five hours of fuel, plenty it would seem, for a three-hour, 45-minute flight. Three hours and 20 minutes pass before the first hint of trouble. By this time, the pilot is on initial approach to Summit Airport, but ATC has troubling news. In November 750, Philadelphia approached just informed me that a guy with Mr. Proach out of Summit and was unable to land at Wilmington, had to divert, uh, had to divert to, out of Philadelphia's airspace. Um, okay, he uh, did not land at Summit, huh? In November 750, affirmative, sir, he was unable to land at Wilmington as well. All right, I guess I'm going to have to divert. Um, let's look for an airport that I can divert into. Salisbury Airport, 53 miles south, apparently seems a promising candidate, and the pilot asks the controller for the latest weather there. Uh, Salisbury uh, 15, uh, correction, Salisbury 21290 observation has a ceiling 400 foot overcast and 8 miles visibility. Um, I want to try Salisbury. And over 750, you're cleared via right turn direct to maintain 5,000. By the time the pilot diverted to Salisbury, it was clear that the earlier forecast of rising ceilings was, if not wrong, then at least mistimed. What's less clear is whether the pilot could have been aware of this earlier in the flight. We don't know whether he called for updates en route. But in any case, there likely were no meaningful updates. The relevant forecasts had not been revised, and his earlier briefing had led him to expect conditions to improve only late in the flight. The decision to divert was another matter. Given the reported weather and the aircraft's fuel status, Salisbury was not an entirely unreasonable choice, despite being 25 minutes away. Nevertheless, from a broader perspective, it does point to a couple of worrisome issues. First, much like his selection of Baltimore as an alternate, the pilot's choice of Salisbury seems to indicate a lack of big-picture weather awareness. Given that similar conditions prevailed over the entire area, the odds of the weather being significantly better at any nearby airport were slim. Second, his conversation with Dover Approach hints at a somewhat passive attitude toward ATC. Hearing the news about the other aircraft's failed approaches, the pilot simply took it for granted that he wouldn't be able to land at his destination. 
At no point did he inquire about the approaches flown or the actual weather conditions. Together, such lapses set the stage for much greater difficulties ahead. Half an hour after the pilot's initial exchange with Dover approach, November 75 Sierra is 11 miles out on the Arnav runway 14 approach to Salisbury. Uh, passing hiders in for you on the GPS to 14. 75 Sierra, you're clear to land runway 14. The Arnav approach to runway 14 has a decision altitude of 306 feet AGL when flown to LPV minimums. LPV requires a WAS-enabled GPS and provides both horizontal and vertical guidance, much like a traditional ILS. For reasons that are unclear, however, the pilot discontinues the approach while still nearly 300 feet above decision altitude. 75 Sierra is going missed. 75 Sierra, contact approach. Shortly thereafter, Approach Control calls Salisbury Tower to let them know that the pilot is attempting the RNAV approach again, rather than switching to the ILS from the opposite direction. Alas, the second attempt goes even worse, with the aircraft deviating from the final approach course and declaring a missed approach 200 feet above decision altitude. And Tower, uh, for some reason my, uh, my GPS is not working right. Um, let me pull up and we'll try it again. After being handed off to approach, however, the pilot decides he's had enough of Salisbury. He queries the controller about whether at Georgetown, Delaware, 22 miles back to the north. Upon learning that the reported ceiling there is 700 feet, he sets a course for airport number three. Together, the attempts to land at Salisbury raise one of the central questions of the flight. Why? After two failed GPS approaches, would the pilot not avail himself of the ILS approach to the opposite runway? The wind was calm, the ILS offered significantly lower minimums, and programming would have been a snap. We'll never know for certain, but there are a couple of potential explanations. It's possible, for example, that the pilot was simply uncomfortable with ILS approaches. It seems more likely, however, that the option was simply overlooked. It was dark, the pilot was flying solo in IMC, things were not going well, and fatigue was likely setting in. It was a situation ripe for mistakes. It was also a circumstance in which ATC might have been able to help. The airport wasn't busy and the controllers knew the pilot was having trouble with the RNAV approach. Under the circumstances, a simple suggestion to try the ILS might have made a real difference. Whatever the case, by the time November 75 Sierra headed back north, having burned an hour of its fuel reserve, the situation had become vastly more serious. It's now 6.01 p.m., roughly an hour past the pilot's original ETA and he's just been cleared for the RNAV runway 22 approach at Georgetown, Delaware. I'm 75 Sierra, I got the Georgetown uh, 2254 zoo observation. Wind is estimated at 180 at 75 miles visibility with mist. Ceiling's uh, overcast at 300 feet. Thank you, sir. Five, Sierra. The ceiling is 400 feet lower than reported just 10 minutes earlier. It's also slightly below minimums for the approach but the pilot opts to proceed anyway. This time he descends 100 feet below minimums, but the end result is the same. Silver, I gotta go around again at 75 Sierra. Silver, 75 Sierra, we're gonna contact one mile south of Georgetown Airport, three approach crossing. Let's try that again, please. Silver, 75 Sierra, Roger, climb me, team, 10,000. Now, however, there's a new concern, fuel. It's 6.26 p.m., four hours and 55 minutes into the flight. I'm running pretty low. How about two? Would that be okay? Number 750, I'm climbing to 2,000. Climbing 1,700, turn left to Rick Boise. Number 750, I'm going to need an alternate airport to land. Well, do you have anything that's easier than this? Number 750, you can try 33 in the number, sir. 
Well, and uh, is the uh, weather better there? In the sun south here, we've got all weather, which is currently 10 miles of visibility, still 500 feet overcast, a little bit better than Georgetown. All right, uh, 3 3 November, thank you. As the aircraft nears Dover Air Force Base, en route to 3 3 November, the pilot asks a logical question. Ma'am, I don't suppose there's any chance I can uh, land at Dover. Number 75 here, negative seven. It's, it's an emergency. There's no way we can have you land here. Okay, then that's here. But it is an emergency. Ten minutes later, and eight miles north of the base, there is a frantic call from the pilot of 75 Sierra. Ma'am, I'm declaring an emergency here. I'm out of fuel. I am out of fuel and going down. By the time the pilot asked Dover approach about landing at the base, he'd been airborne for five hours. From his flight planning, or failing that, his fuel gauges, he must have known that he had precious little time left, and he still had more than 10 miles to go before commencing a non-precision approach in marginal weather. How could any pilot consider that anything other than an emergency? The most likely explanation, sadly, is that he was ashamed to confess his predicament, and all too aware of the fact that he was talking to a military controller about landing in an Air Force base. Those factors, coupled with the controller's strong, if appropriately qualified statement about landing at the base, are likely what kept him pushing on in silence, despite the dire situation, and ultimately what cost him his life. Ma'am, I'm declaring an emergency here. I'm out of fuel. I am out of fuel and going down. Give me vectors, please. Over the next few minutes, confusion reigns as the approach and tower controllers attempt to vector the stricken aircraft for landing at Dover. I'm out of fuel and going down. Number seven five zero, Dover twelve o'clock, six miles. Keep talking to me, please. Number seven five zero. I am going down. Negative, negative, negative. I'm still heading in the right direction, 75 Sierra. Number 75 Sierra, Summer, sir. If you aren't heading in the right direction, you can expect the landing in one floor, sir. This is a strong course right now. On course, but out of energy. Shortly thereafter, the aircraft collides with trees two miles off the end of the runway and crashes to an abrupt fatal halt. The crash of November 75 Sierra is something of an enigma. While it's easy to see how a pilot of modest experience could find himself suckered in by marginal weather, and an inaccurate forecast. The mistakes that turned bad luck into tragedy are harder to understand. In the end, though, what matters is what we can learn. And this is a case with no shortage of lessons. The first and most obvious is that weather can be a deal breaker. And when conditions argue for a change of plans, safe pilots listen. Forecasts can be wrong and it's particularly important to be wary when conditions are expected to improve. If you decide to go, always leave yourself an out and get updates en route. Weather is dynamic, and our decision-making process needs to be equally dynamic. Likewise, avoid focusing too narrowly on the destination airport. Zoom out and look at the whole region. Legal doesn't always equal safe, and in a large weather system, the only realistic alternates may be far away, which means carrying plenty of extra fuel, even if it requires a stop en route. A good rule of thumb with large systems is to start with twice the fuel required to reach your destination. Even then, it's still critical to have a viable plan B, and if that falls through, to speak up about your situation in the clearest possible terms. 
don't be afraid to expand your options by using the E word. Had the pilot, instead of saying, quote, I'm running pretty low, declared an emergency and told the Dover approach controller that he had less than 20 minutes of fuel, he'd probably be alive today. That points to another issue. Military airfields are fair game in emergency situations. There may be some explaining to do after you land, but it's a small price to pay to ensure a safe outcome. Awareness of approach options and the ability to exercise those options is also important. A diversion in low weather at night is no time to be hesitant about GPS programming or unaware of an ILS approach to your alternate. Finally, there's the matter of decision making. It can be tempting to hope that one more try will fix things. But in truth, you're usually just digging the hole deeper. Try something different. Don't let plans and expectations become blinders that keep you from seeing better options. The crash of November 7-5 Sierra was a tragedy not only for the pilot, his family, and friends, but for the medical community as well. It seems safe to say that, had the accomplished surgeon faced a crisis during an operation, he would have availed himself of every resource to save his patient. In a case with many ironies, the fact that he was unable to extend the same level of care to himself is perhaps the saddest. <laughs>